unless you do X within a short timetable and in a specific way, you're going to lose a right. So, you know, we often see them in relation to things like extensions of time, loss and expense claims. You know, an extension of time, unless you notify us within 48 hours of becoming aware that circumstances that's going to delay your works, you lose all your rights to an extension of time, you know, and it's not just you've got to notify us, it's got, you've got to notify us to a specific email address. So if you send it to the other email address, that's not valid. You don't, you don't get your extension of time. So it's, it's showing them all these things and going, look, you, you've got to comply with that because if you get it wrong, you're losing out on a massive amount of money there. Hi, Gavin Kyle here. I'm the gaffer and we have a brilliant guest here, Sam Bowden. And Sam is a, a dispute resolution expert from Holmes and Hills. He's got a background as a solicitor. He's a chair and founder of Construction Excellence Essex. That's right, yeah. And delighted to have you, Sam. Really, really looking forward Cheers, to Gavin. today's discussion because we've got a lot of good stuff to talk about. We've got a lot of interesting topics in terms of um, where the construction industry is at the moment, uh, where the risk is, how do people manage risk and financial risk and construction risk within their business. But, you know, I always like to say, Sam was born and now Sam is here. What happened in the middle? <laughs> so can you give us some background as regards, where did you come from? What, you know, what yeah. was Sam as a young lad? Uh, you where probably, did probably don't want to know what I was like as a young lad, but uh, <laughs> we'll skip over that bit. No, so I grew up in Stockport, just outside Manchester. Yeah. Um, went to school up there, age of 18, went off to uni and I, I didn't go down the usual route of doing my A-levels and then going and doing a law degree. So my interest as a kid, I was really into animals and science and stuff like that. So I ended up doing a biology degree, okay. um, went off to Sheffield to do that. Kind of came out of uni and went, right, what, what do people with a biology de degree do? Yeah. And I was kind of scratching my head a bit. I worked in the, the labs at the uni for a bit, then got an opportunity to work in a not-for-profit sector. A friend kind of headhunted me for a, for a project there, supervising a free training program for people from disadvantaged backgrounds doing all sorts of creative stuff, music, design, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't going to pay the bills long term. So I did a bit of soul searching, kind of, you know, what do I want out of a career? What's, what do I think my skill set is? Yeah. And actually went full circle and went, well, actually, I'd honed in on the law being something that probably was going to work for me. It's kind of left field, isn't it? Kind of from where you... <laughs> well, actually, it's only at that point I, I kind of thought back and I thought, do you know what? There's loads of lawyers. Like my mum was a solicitor, my granddad was, some yeah. of my cousins are. And I'd never really thought about it. But I ended up here. Um, and then from there, it went from, I always thought I was going to be a kind of corporate transactional lawyer, you know, like yeah. one, of, one of these boys on suits or something. Yeah. Um, like the movie, or like, I like the series, by the way. Yeah, uh, qu really quickly cool. realized that wasn't really me at all. Yeah. Um, so got into dispute resolution. Yeah. And from there. Do you mind me asking, what was your mother and what did she specialize in? Oh, well, she's from an era where people were kind of, General fairly license. general practitioners so i think she did a bit of a, a lot of family law but did um, she have her own practice or did she work in no college? she worked for a for a firm in our our town okay um she never had the bug to go out on her own or anything like that it was always no I, I, I don't think she had those sorts of ambitions to be honest yeah um and in terms of your family like have you brothers and sisters uh, yeah i've got one older brother um okay. He's he works in ecology, so he does a lot of like tree surveys and land yeah. management stuff. Okay, and then so just the brother and yourself, is it? Yeah. And um, what do they think about uh, you going into bio into the the biology? Was it at the start, or what was it? Uh, they were supportive of that. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I necessarily got a huge amount of <clears throat> direction from my parents. I still, you know, thinking yeah. about careers. It was just kind of well. Do, did, do what you enjoy doing at the time, but you know, see where it goes. 17 years old, you don't. But when you went back and said you're going to do the law, I'm sure they had uh, plenty of. Um, <laughs> Funnily enough, my mum tried to put me off. Oh, come on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't think. Well, her, her, um, her logic was that the law at that point wasn't what it was when she qualified in turn. I said, well, that's fine. I've done my research on what it is now, not what it was when you started. So, wow. Um, there you go. And it is, and like, um, like I, I studied it for a year, mm. and I passed the exams, and I swear I never done uh, as hard an exam 
as yeah. the law exams. Yeah. They are unbelievably difficult. Uh, now, I wouldn't be blessed with academic uh, genius by any means, but I love the law. I absolutely, yeah. I love everything about it. I love the case studies. I love going back over the old cases. I love trying to compare mm. and, and sort of connecting new cases with old cases. Yeah, it's looking for the patterns, but patterns. also the distinctions. And, you know, yeah. people people often say to us, well, didn't this case say you can do this or not do that? So, yeah, but the facts are slightly different. There's always yeah. that little nuanced difference. Yeah. And did you, when you were doing just, uh, look, I'm, this is for myself. How do you remember all the case law? I don't even try to. Okay. Um, but at the time when you were studying, though? That's different. You know, you cram for exams and yeah. you, you have your ways to. But, I mean, nowadays, you know, you can ask me to quote case names. I know the general principles. Yeah. And I can go away and remind myself of the case name. But I don't need to know the case name and be able to pull it out of my hat there and then. Yeah. Well, that, that was my biggest crutch. was like, yeah. oh, my God, you have to know that inside out. And I was like, how am I going to know that inside out? So I, I got to the stage where in, in, in Ireland there's Gaelic football and there's 15 players on the team and there's usually around six or seven subs. So I said to myself, right, I'm going to pick uh, the most important parts of the team and I'm going to put the most important case studies in mm -hmm. those positions. Yep. And then I'm going to put the less... Uh, uh, prominent cases on the sideline as okay. the subs. Yeah, yeah. So when we were asked to flip over the uh, the exam, I didn't flip over the exam. I basically wrote out the football team Got first. You. Yeah, and yeah. I said, right. Yeah. My logic was all I could do was deal with, uh, you know, those 20 odd cases and mm. know them inside out and then yeah. try and figure out what the question was asking and how could I fit these case studies into yeah. some sort of a logic. It worked. But uh, it definitely put me off going into the second year. And I said, no, I think I'll just stick with health and yeah. safety and stuff like that. But, um, but it's different in practice, you know, do, doing an exam where it's closed book and you've got to remember the case names. Yeah. It's different. You know, we work in an environment where we have access to online resources, legal textbooks, all those sorts of things. So yeah. we know the principles. If we need to be reminded of the case name, it's a simple, simple thing to do. Yeah. And, 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 uh, like, are you, are you, is your niche construction? Yeah. So where did that come about? Is it just because you fell in with that company or had you got a background before this company that you're with at the moment? No, no, I don't, I don't come from a construction background. Um, I think it was about the people for me. Okay. Um, I remember having a conversation with the partner that supervised me when I was coming up as a newly qualified solicitor. Okay. So at that point, I was doing a very broad general commercial litigation practice so resolving disputes about all sorts of different things yeah and we were having a discussion about my career progression where i wanted to get to and i i remember saying to him i said well look the things that i really enjoy doing the people i really liked acting for are the contractors mm. who come in and there's no pretense they're yeah. just genuine down-to-earth people yeah. that's the people i like to sit and talk yeah. to yeah and you know, the spark kind of Grafters. lit then. It was like, well, you know, we can make a, a, a niche practice here. There's plenty of construction work around. So yeah. it was springboard off that really of me going, right, I'm going to, I'm going to learn the construction law a little bit more. And so you went straight into plans. homes and hills from college, did you? Uh, so, yeah. So I, I did my biology degree, worked for a few years, went back and did a master's in law. Wow. Off the back of that, uh, moved down from the North, met an Essex girl and, and, and yeah, ended up in Essex. Um, and it was one of those funny things. I was finishing off my studies part time, yeah. knew I needed to pay the bills. I was about to get married. And um, I sent off a speculative email, as you do, to a local firm. Said, you know, I realize you're an expanding firm. Yeah. You know, happy to come in and do the photocopying or whatever you need me to do. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, Fair play to you, by the way. Well, you know, yeah. you, you've, you've, you've got to do these things, haven't you? Yeah. And actually, it turned into a training contract, which turned into a couple of years later, an offer of a, a job as a qualified solicitor. And I've been there ever since. So how long is that? Um, I joined as a trainee in 2007. So what's that? Is that 17 years now? Yeah. Oh, 
Yeah, so you're well in in terms of the culture of the company and yeah, very and, much so. Yeah, uh, you know, and is it a generational uh, practice or has it been handed down or is it a, you know is there families? No, um, I mean the name Holmes and Hills yeah. com comes from the families originally, but yeah. I mean the, the firm's over two hundred years old, so wow. oh they're kind of they're not in the picture anymore. Okay, so it's it's kind of you know it's been handed down into a, a, a sort of board level practice if yeah. you like yeah how does that work in terms of the governance then is is so what way is that set up yeah so it's run by the partners okay of which you have different levels of partner partners you have the equity partners who've invested money into the firm yeah then you have fixed chair and salaried partners who don't have as much kind of skin in the game as it were yeah but would still have a vote yeah yeah, in terms yeah, yeah, of yeah. the annual uh, strategic meetings. Yeah, I mean, like there, are, there are some decisions that get taken at equity partner level. Yeah. Some of them we open up to the to the broader partnership as well. So they are very much involved. My um, uneducated uh, market view of the legal profession mm. is that there's not enough legal professionals coming through the channel. It has been very difficult to recruit over the last few years. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. So... Are you doing anything different? What are you doing to, mm -hmm. to be different to get to get the, you know, get the quality? Or not like you're gonna, mm. you, or we go to the universities, we do trade shows, la la la. Yeah, but what are you doing different? I suppose. So like, I think for us, it's about who we are as a firm. Yeah. So you mentioned about the culture a minute ago and me being very ingrained in that. I'd, yeah. I guess over seventeen years, it's it's more than just being ingrained in it; it's actually having an influence on it. Yeah. Um. We opened a new office, a much bigger kind of open plan office to supplement all our other sort of smaller offices. Um, 2020, signed the lease just before we all got sent home for however many months it was. Yeah. Um, Boris said, you can come back out of lockdown. Just, you know, we just finished the fit out, which we'd committed a load of money to. Opened up in September 2020, and about three weeks later, Boris said, "Right, you've all got to go back home again." And it was it was one of those horrible moments. We're going, "Have we bitten off more than we can chew here?" Yeah. But that's been fantastic. You know, we we spent years looking for the right office in the right location. Yeah. To so we could fit it out in the right way mm. and build it around your business. yeah. It, yeah. It, it's a really nice workspace. I love you. I love the way you said that because so many people bought grey boxes. Yeah. And we didn't. Yeah. Um, it's a really, really nice space and we turned it into what we wanted so that when not just clients come in, but also staff that we're trying to recruit come yeah. in, they go, this is brilliant. I love this office. doesn't matter whether you're a legal business, a recruitment business. Uh, we had a digital marketing guy uh, on the podcast mm. recently and everyone said the same, brand and culture. Yeah. Set the brand and set the culture and have it organic to who you are. Yeah, and then let people decide whether that is a value that they can trust and believe in, and can see themselves in the future with you, or not. Yeah, and it's just it's not there's no big deal if if it's not for you, it's not for you. So one of the things that I've taken to do now, obviously, you go to any law firm if you're looking for a job, they'll all tell you they're a great progressive firm and they've got a fantastic work life balance and the yeah. culture's lovely and inclusive and all of this. I think we can all say that. Yeah. But how does that re recruit yeah. see between the firms that are genuine and the ones mm. that are just throwing out the words that they think they need you to hear? So yeah. I say now, look, come and talk to my team. Don't take it from me. I, I will tell you it and I will tell it you, tell you what I think of the culture and I'll tell you very passionately what a great firm I think we've got. But actually, you know, I've got a vested interest in this. Yeah. So you've got to take that with a pinch of salt. Yeah. Go and talk to the members of my team. Yeah. See what they say about it. Yeah. And, and I'm confident that I can do that. I'm not going to worry about what they're going to say. Yeah. I think the partners need to listen to this podcast because you're doing a great <laughs> job of selling that business. <laughs> yes, good. <laughs> but how many interns then would you take on generally? Is, is there like a, a, a model? Like we take on interns every two years or, every, or two a year um, or 10 a year? Or if, yeah, it, it's a difficult question to answer yeah. because when I joined the firm we were a much Lee, smaller Lee. firm than we are now so we'd have one maybe two trainees yeah. per year um, this last intake we took on I think it was eight wow. and actually we we're in discussions about having two intakes per year and, and taking on even more so wow. 
my god that's just but it, you know, yeah, like, the, yeah. the requirement for trainees grows with the size of the business so we've yeah. just we've just tipped um 200 staff now oh my god so actually proportionately it's that's a it's needed. that's a serious business mm. yeah um like uh, i suppose uh, the barrier to entry in the legal profession isn't what it used to be either. It's a lot more open in terms of access. Would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. They've changed the the, the academic route into it. Yeah. So they have a thing without going into too much detail and throwing too many acronyms out at you. Yeah. We used to have a thing called the LPC, the Legal Practice Course, and that's been phased out in favour of something that they call the, the SQE, the Solicitor's Qualification Exam. Yeah. But it's a more... It's a more vocational route into it, so you're, yeah. you're kind of more on the job training. Yeah, no, I like. Um, I think that's one of the biggest uh, shifts in the legal profession that mm. has been made. A, a sort of, and I think it had to happen. I think, uh, in fairness, because no disrespect, but it seemed like a class system for for a long period of time. That mm. you know, unless you were in a certain region or a certain class of distinction it was hard to get into these areas and, and it was kind of, you know, word of mouth and it was kind of like, we'll bring you along. But like that day is gone. It's kind of like, if you're good enough, you're good enough. And, yeah. I mean, you know, there's avenues for you, whether you're a mature student or whether you're, you know, uh, grafting from the start. And yeah. I, I think that's, you know, it's a, it's brilliant to see that. And I think, you know, there's a lot of other in, uh, industries could learn from that, that, you know, go back and look at the vocational uh, aspect and see can you make it more accessible mm. to get people into the in, but still you're struggling does the legal yeah. profession still struggling to fill positions is that a salary thing do you think um yeah i mean salaries have, <laughs> salaries have changed massively in the yeah. time that i've been involved um it's, it's a mixture of things isn't it you know mm. salaries lack of people around um fairly fierce competition yeah so you're you're like you know you're competing against probably five or six other practices within a, a geographical location. Yeah, and I, th I think I think construction law particularly is quite an interesting one because it's something that you don't really get taught at uni. Yeah. Um, you only really start to get exposed to it if you end up in a firm that has a construction law practice. Yeah. And they are fairly few and far between. Yeah. You know, if you go to the big cities... Yeah, there's loads in London and, and so forth. But actually, yeah. if you look regionally, if you don't want that London life, yeah. um, it's hard to find the firms that have a, a proper yeah. construction practice. We, we find there's a lot of sort of the medium-sized firms that will put it on their website. We do construction law. But actually, when you scratch ben beneath the surface, yeah. it's some they don't have the general debt. dispute resolution lawyers that do a little bit of it amongst everything else. Yeah, that's what I loved about your profile as well, is that... Um, you know, you are that organic structure that, you know, if I'm a small to medium construction company, mm. I don't have to be afraid about knocking on your door and, no. you know, uh, feeling that, you know, it's beneath me that, you know, wh who am I to go to these guys? They're, mm. they're much bigger than I could ever afford and stuff like that. And, you know, I think you're, you're an all for everybody type of company, whether you've got loads of money or whether you're a small to medium enterprise. Yeah. And I think that's, for, you know, and I think it's a credit to you that you've Cheers. carried out that niche. And, and definitely that's one of the reasons I wanted to get you on the mm. show today as well was there's loads of people that, uh, that are listening to the show that are probably one man band in a van, yeah. you know, listen to the show on the way to work or coming back home from work. And they're just, you know, they're signing contracts probably. Uh, they probably don't have their own contracts. Um, uh, they're signing up to tenders, but they're not really probably looking into the detail in any great detail because yep. they need the job. Yeah. And I know that, you know, I'm saying stuff here that's probably you're dealing with on a daily basis. Well, yeah, funnily enough, I was going to add to that and say, I, I, don't, I don't think that's just restricted to the one-man band in a van. No. I think that is... Um, that's pervasive throughout the industry up up to you know maybe 200 employees yeah i mean we get we get clients come through the door and they'll be turning over millions of pounds yeah but they're not looking at contracts yeah and you know quite often it's it's people who've been on the tools they've done well they've gone do you know what? i could do this for myself yeah all of a sudden their business has taken off and they're yeah. getting these really high value contracts that they're not reading yeah I, 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 like, uh, people are going to listen to this and they're going to, like, they're either going to go, 
I don't want to listen to this and switch it off or they're going to go, I need to listen to this because yeah. I'm one of those people that actually doesn't look at the finer detail. Mm. Now, if you want to switch off the podcast, that's fine. You can't bury your head in the sand because like, uh, let me give a scenario. If I'm looking at a tender and there's a big document that comes with it and that they tell me that I'm down to the final two and mm. that I need to sharpen my pencil, which is the usual crack. Yep. In other words, you're, you're nearly there, nudge, nudge, and I decide I'm going to drop it by 10 or 4%, let's, let's mm. say, for conservative purposes, and I win the contract. Should I be contacting you? I would say you probably want to be talking to us before you've won the contract, or, or certainly before you've, you've executed the contract or entered into it. Wow. Um, so you want to be knowing what you're signing up to. Where are the risks? You're going to be a busy boy if everybody has, has to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but this is one of those things. Actually, we, we often say within the team, we are al almost deliberately going out to cut off our work stream. Yeah. So, you know, we can sit back and go, let's let them ignore their contracts. And when it all goes wrong, they're going to need someone to sort it out. Yeah. And actually, that's, that takes up a lot of our time, a lot of our energy. And yeah. that obviously translates into the fee that we have to charge for that. Yeah. Work. What we've been consistently saying to people is, look, let us review your contracts. Come in. We'll, I, either you come to us or we'll come to you. Or if you're at the other end of the country, we can do it on a team's call. Yeah. We, we always prefer face to face, but you know, sometimes yeah. needs must, but let's sit down for you. We'll spend half a day. Yeah. We will train you in what we look for in a contract. Love it. Those red flag clauses where we go, don't sign that. Yeah. So or, or, all right, that's a bit of an amber clause. You can sign it, but you need to know what the risks are. Maybe you could see if you can push back on it. Yeah, I know people say, "Well, we're stuck with it. We don't have any bargaining power." But you, you don't ask, you don't get. Yeah. Um, come in, do a session like that with us. That's going to be infinitely cheaper than asking us to fix a problem after it's happened. Yeah. But not only that, we're giving you that advice and training you so that you can go away, and maybe you're not going to pick it up overnight. I granted. But over a period of time, the more you start looking at your contracts, you're going to be spotting those clauses for yourself. So actually, you don't need to be coming to us every single time. Wow. I don't know that I've heard that uh, discussion being had mm. with other legal uh, construction so-called experts. That's the first time I've heard somebody saying, by the way, I'm going to give you the red flag model. I'm yeah. going to lay it out in front of you. It's the whole kind That's, of te that, teach a man to fish, isn't it? Rather than just giving him a fish every no, time. I think it's. I think. I think you're. I think you're being humble, <laughs> because I think. This, I think what you've done there is you've immediately placed the trust on the table and said, mm. "If you trust us, we trust you." And the only way we're going to trust each other is have a level playing field. Do you know what though? It's it's a really difficult. Um, it's a difficult pitch to make because a lot of contractors will listen to it. And go, yeah, but I don't have a problem. Yeah. That's that. Until you have a problem. You don't have a problem until you have a problem. When yeah. you have the problem, it's expensive. Yeah. And, so. and the other thing, I suppose, that you're dealt with as well is, uh, well, where's the email for that? Um, when did you sign that? And where did Record you put that keeping. document? And and then all of a sudden, you know, you're, you've everything compiled. And then all of a sudden someone says, oh, yeah, I have a text message as well. Mm -hmm. Did you not get that? Well, well, that's actually the fundamental part of the whole case. Yeah. And you, you're only telling us now. Yeah. Uh, so... Is there any sort of nuggets you could give us in terms of people managing the flow of information so that when they do maybe yeah. come to you in a reactive mode, that they go, by the way, here's a box? Yeah. Good record keeping is absolutely essential. Yeah. Um, what we'll, one of the things we'll teach people about is when we go in and do a training session with them, we'll say, look, first and foremost, you need to spot these clauses where we call them condition precedent clauses. Yeah. The clause that says, unless you do X within a short timetable and in a specific way, you're yeah. going to lose a right. So, you know, we often see them in relation to things like extensions of time, mm -hmm. loss and expense claims. You know, an extension of time, unless you notify us within 48 hours of becoming aware that yeah. the circumstances that's going to delay your works, yeah. you lose all your rights to an extension of time. 
you know, and it's not just you've got to notify us, it's got, you've got to notify us to a specific email address. Yeah. So if you send it to the other email address, that's not valid. Wow. You don't you don't get your extension of time. So it's it's showing them all these things yeah. and going, look, you, you've got to comply with that because yeah. if you get it wrong, you're, you're losing right. out on a massive amount of money there. Yeah. And then it's saying, well, right, how do you manage that on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah. Because your guys on site need to know when they need to tell the guys in the office, right, we've got to notify upstream that yeah. something's happened or not happened. So we'll, um, we'll advise doing like an operational checklist. I love it. A one side yeah. sheet of A4, you stick it up with the contract and it's got all the key stuff, you know, extensions of time, how, you know, how quickly do you have to notify delays? Who do you notify? Yeah. What if there are variations? Does it have to be in writing? Yeah. It's not in writing. What do we do about it? All yeah. of these sorts of things, just just a kind of crib sheet. Yeah. I, I, the, when you're talking there, I'm 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 thinking to myself, the words or the or the the double word, if you like, tripwire. Yeah. That there's tripwires all over these contracts. Yes. Yeah, there are. And uh, there's people constructing models to insert tripwires into mm. contracts, knowing that certain individuals that might not be up to speed mm. or aware or that might be blinded are going to not challenge these tripwires. And I suppose I, I look at it from my own sense of maturity. I remember signing contracts and I knew that there were certain areas in my gut feeling looking yeah. at the contracts and I'm saying to myself, that doesn't sound right, but it's probably just a generic contract and everybody's doing the same and nobody's really got, you know, done in terms of the commercials. Now, touch wood, I, I would have, I just, it, it, uh, there was a trust-based system mm. in place which overrided the contract, but that's not always the case, and especially in construction. Yeah, we, we hear that a lot. You know, it's, we, we hear a couple of things. One is we don't have a choice. Yeah. If we don't sign this contract, yeah. we don't get the work. Well, yeah. Okay, that may or may not be true. Yeah. But until you ask about amending terms, you're never going to know whether you can push back on them. Yeah. But then the answer is, well, if you've got all these horrendously onerous clauses in the contract and the other party refuses to negotiate on them, that to me is raising alarm bells. Yeah. And, and it's a commercial decision. It's like, well, do you want that contract? Yeah. You know, looking at the risk profile of it. I love the way you said risk profile because... A lot of the guys that are probably listening in on this podcast don't necessarily have a risk committee mm. or somebody that's holding them accountable mm. for the decisions they're making. And with the best will in the world, our ego and our want to prove that we're successful overrides the rational thinking yeah. of contractual law and a bit like health and safety. Well, just come on, you know. I'll do it safely. Come on. Yeah, I'll do I, it I, legally. I, you know, there'll be no issues with the contract. Paddy's sound. He, he, we know him for years. Well, this he is the other thing us. I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, we, you know, we, oh yeah, we've got a great relationship with that one person at that company. Yeah. Yeah, but what when halfway through the project he and they get a new job somewhere, somewhere else and somebody else comes in and they want to prove themselves. Yeah. You know, relationships. And, you know, a great relationship is great until... Yeah. There's a couple of hundred grand riding on yeah. how that relationship pans out. Yeah. I spoke to a QS only recently and he told me that the model for his company was to, to employ him and people like him at the base salary rate as low as they could give mm. him, but to give him 10% bonus. bonus on every uh, shilling and pence yeah. that was saved uh, that they didn't have to spend with a contractor. Yeah. And I knew I knew that this goes on, mm. but to hear it uh, in the raw sense coming directly from somebody and that he like he obviously he's disgusted by it. He's not in the industry anymore and he's he's, he's gone past that. But he was only starting out and that was what is explained mm. to him was in other words, we want you to find all the weak holes and weak points within the contractor. And we're going to incentivize you. Yeah. Um, with pretty hefty, like ten percent mm. of 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 taking money off the table is a pretty nice commission when you think about it. But I think, from my own perspective and from where I see it, is 
you have to take the personality out of this situation and exactly what you were discussing mm. there in terms of oh we've got this individual and that person is someone we can trust and it's going to be reliable regardless of whether they stay or not you have to take the human element out of the process when it's a contractual arrangement i think uh, I, I agree to a point okay but I'm, I'm gonna pr- perhaps play devil's advocate a little bit and say i i always think you know in anything relationships are important mm. Um, it's having the balance, isn't it? You know, you need those relationships. And I, I guess to sort of level things up a little bit, um, it's easy for a lot of subcontractors to say, oh, well, these main contractors that are trying to trying to have one over on us. But actually, we act for a lot of main contractor clients as well who are actually very, very um, decent people, yeah. reputable, and yeah. actually realise the value of good specialist subcontractors. Yeah. And and they get a bit offended when they hear all the talk about, well, you know, everyone's out subby bashing. So it's a and it goes back to that that point I was making a moment ago. It's like, do you want to sign up to that contract? Well, if it's a relationship that you're not sure about and they won't negotiate on the contract and it's a horrible contract, to me, that's not the contract I want to sign. If I can find that main contractor where actually I, I do genuinely build up a relationship with them over time and I, and I get to trust them, I'm not taking my eye off the ball with the contract. I'm firmly looking at that contract and I don't see any issues with having a friendly and amicable relationship with the businesses that you're working with. But at the same time, saying, well, yeah, but we do have a contract in place and I'm going to follow that contract. Yeah, but the, you, you might all also look at the other side of things. You might be asked to produce a contract that is an aggressive contract yeah. in, in the favor of the main contractor. Yeah. So how would you approach that if I came to you and said, I want you to produce a tripwire mm. contract? Well, we... we, we, we <laughs> Sorry for asking. No, 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 not at all. What I was going to say is we can do that for main contractor or subcontractor. So it, we, we start in that question maybe from the premise that it's always the contract being issued downstream. Yeah. But actually we see a lot of main contractors that perhaps don't get it right. They forget to issue a contract. You know, how many, how many times have we said, well, we've been on site for three months and we haven't got the contract yet. Yeah. Well, all right. If, if at that point when you tendered for the works, you, you know, you gave your price and you said, this is all subject to our terms and conditions. And you put that on the table upstream. Yeah. If you do it right, that becomes you know, the I, contract. I love you said. I love the way. I love that you've said that mm. because there's people uh, uh, probably listen to this as well. What's wrong with having your own terms and conditions and your own contractual um, um, scenario? Um, well, what you put that on the table yeah. and say, by the way, this is who I am, and this is how we are, and this is what we do, this is what we're about, yep. and this is the way we're going to work. I, I respect your tender process, and I'll put the tender in but you're going to have to harmonize the contracts that you're going to give me for this tender along with my contract. Yeah. So I would say the question is what's wrong with having your own contract. I would say it's not a question of what's wrong with it. It's everything is right with having it. I think, yeah. I think everyone should have their own but contract. It's, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not a, it's no, not a time, is it? you know, we have clients that say, well, there's no point in us having our own contract to issue upstream because we'll never be allowed to contract on those terms. We'll yeah. be forced to accept the, the contract that's coming downstream. Yeah. Possibly, but you'll, you'll always have an employer or a main contractor that doesn't issue a contract or says, yeah, that's coming, but get on site and we'll, we'll issue it later. Yeah. Well, actually you've got an opportunity to conclude the contract on your terms yeah. and then say to them, thanks, but no thanks to their contract. Um, mm, but like, um, so if I put my terms and, and uh, agreements across to the main contractor and the main contractor doesn't issue me with my terms and agreement to sign off on, which one takes precedence? So this is a concept, and, and this is one of the things we talked through at great length in our training sessions, yeah. because we, w- as soon as we start talking about it, we have clients going, well, what if we said that and they did this and in yeah. this order? And, it, and it's brilliant. So it's, yeah. it's a concept that in the legal profession, we call it the battle of the forms. Okay. Um, someone once described it to me as like a, a game of ping pong. Yeah. And I, I really like that 
and I was going to, and it works well on this table actually. Yeah. So if I ban my terms and conditions across to you and say I'm, yeah. I'm going to come do some work for you on these yeah. terms, yeah, and you say uh, no, no, you're not, and you yeah. knock it back to me, you go, I'm going to do it on my terms, yeah, and we have that rally backwards and forwards, yeah, until the point but that is healthy, yeah, yeah, but at some point either we're going to go, oh, do you know what, I, I don't, I don't want to play this game, and we go, or we start works. Well, it's whoever's knocked that ping pong ball back to the other side last before the work start. Wow. Is it that absolute? Yeah. Now, there's always, it, it always creates grey areas about who's said what and in what order and stuff. But yeah. that's the general premise of it. Oh, my God. I never hear that. That's, yeah. That is. So we get it a lot where people say, well, we've been on site for three months and so we haven't got the contract yet. Yeah. So, well, okay. You know, what did you agree at the point just before you started work? Yeah. You might have agreed very little. Yeah. Or you might have put across a quote with your own set of terms and conditions on. Well, if they haven't responded to say, we don't accept those and they've let you on site. Yeah. They're going to be incorporated. Yeah. So that's why I would say to, to every contractor, have your own set of terms and conditions because there will be instances where they do apply. That's amazing. I like that's just blown my mind that like literally the last email could be the one that's the defining email well, and, and this is the question we always get asked well can I send that email at like 7.45 in the morning <laughs> when I'm meant to be on site at 8 make and, sure it goes into spam and it, yeah and it's one of those it's like well theoretically I suppose you probably could but, but you'd probably want to give it a little bit more of a window but, but does an email stack up in terms of acceptance if you have brought something to the party's attention, if I've said to you, like, here's my terms and conditions, I'm starting on site yeah. to do those works that you've asked me to do for the agreed price. And if I don't hear from you in the next you, five working if, days. If you, don't, if you don't tell me that those terms aren't going to apply, you know, the onus is on you to turn around and say, wait a minute, yeah. you, can't, you can't start the works until we've agreed this contract. Yeah. Or to push back and go, no, 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 no. It, I've told you before, it's, it's on my contract. Yeah. Well, that... You know, nine times out of ten, that's going to be binding. There's always some slight... Do you know what, Sam? We've probably been talking for the last 10 or 15 minutes, mm. and we're talking about having the contracts done up front. Yep. And the majority of your business, I take it, is, is actually where the contracts haven't been done properly up front. Or yeah. Where, and you know, have been left holding the bag, or somebody's been left holding the bag because there's a problem and nobody's getting paid. And it just goes to show you that the conversation has been so strong mm. about having due diligence and upfront, you know, openness and transparency yeah. to sit down and be mature. And it, it, just because you're, uh, you know, have five people working for you or 50 people or 200 people doesn't mean to say you don't, you shouldn't have time to sit down and review the contracts. Yeah, I guess it's, it's working that into your business model, isn't it? It it's, is. It's saying... Into your margins. Yeah. How, how are we going to make sure we properly assess the risks of each contract yeah you know are we gonna give ourselves the skill set so we can do that in-house and we need the the manpower to do that yeah you know everyone says well i haven't got the time to sit around and read a 200 page contract i finally get that yeah and that's when it's a question of well okay can you outsource that yeah um and if you can can you justify the costs of doing that mm -hmm. you know everyone says, well i can't i can't add the price onto the contract Mm -hmm. then I'm not going to get the job. Um, you know, every business is going to approach that in a different way. Yeah. But I think just avoiding the topic, you're just storing up a problem for later. Yeah, 100%. And, um, and it's, you know, it's a big problem. If something goes wrong on a construction project, once you're, you know, in some sort of hundreds of thousands, millions of pound contracts, when it goes wrong, it goes spectacularly wrong. And that's, yeah. that's make or break for a lot of contractors. Yeah. And I suppose one thing we, we should probably make clear here is that we're not giving people advice. We're, we're giving people scenarios mm. about where they need to, and they, uh, 100%, yeah. they need to reach out to someone like you uh, and, and get that solid plan in place at, that you have a methodology for managing risk. And there's a legal aspect to that. It's not just, you know, certain individuals' opinions on certain topics. Mm when it comes to the legality of the contracts, unless you're qualified and competent, you don't have 
you don't really have yeah you can bring them to train into a, to a level but I, I, I presume you know at the end of the day you still need to review that that document um yeah but you know there's there's a lot of people out there who will offer to review contracts for you some will be very experienced and know everything to spot some won't yeah um I, I think, you know, my view is there's, there's no substitute for getting a, a specialist construction lawyer Brilliant. to do it. Um, not a- not least because if they get it wrong, they've got a massive professional indemnity insurance policy that, <laughs> that covers you if they, no, if they give you bad advice. We're, we're, like we've, we constantly, there's a team in this podcast as well is about um, you're having construction language and you're talking construction language on a daily basis. Yeah in the industry or you're, mm. you're buying up to speed with trends with yep. the language of construction as opposed to the language of conveyancing or mm-hmm. personal injury or whatever else yeah. and as soon as you start talking about other things you're diluting yep. the actual core um, message within your so-called mm. mission statement uh, which is exactly where you outlined your mission state and the statement yeah. at the start and you know even for when we talk about builders, you know, like an electrician, then being asked, can you do the CCTV as well? Oh, sure, I'll do the CCTV. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure, it's it's easy. Now, all of a sudden, you're not having conversations about what your core business yeah. is. Yeah. And you're having that every day. So you know, and I'd say, like, it, it must be a fascinating place to work if you want to get into law and you want to be in the construction space to just see all these contracts coming in. Mm. Do you see a commonality of inserted paragraphs that are the trend within construction at the moment um yeah there are familiar themes that you'll see you know the same sorts of sorts of clauses dealing with the same sorts of issues yeah um you're not going to give us one or two of them well it 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 just depends you know it, it depends on on who's issuing the contract um so say for example if i'm Joe Bloggs, plumbing and heating, and I'm about to start a three million euro or pound contract. If I'm scanning over a contract, where would you tell me to look at the high risk uh, categories? The things I'd be looking for is, is the type of clause. And I mentioned them before, condition precedent clauses. So it's anything that says, unlock. And sometimes they will say it is a condition precedent that you do X, Y, and Z. Otherwise, you don't get whatever. And it's usually money. Sometimes it'll be time. Um, They don't always call themselves condition precedent clauses. So you need to be able to understand what one is and spot it. Yeah. And in a nutshell, it's a clause that says, you know, you've got a right to something, but unless you take a certain step in a certain way by a certain time scale, you lose that right. Yeah. So, you know, things like extensions of time, entitlement to loss and expense. Um, sometimes you see them around payment applications mm-hmm. um, in terms of the validity of a payment application. So unless it's sent to a certain email address by a certain date, it's not a yeah. valid application and so forth. Yeah. So it's, it's spotting those clauses, I yeah. think. Yeah. If you can spot those, you're, you're going to be much far further ahead because you can then... Either we say, you know, there's a a couple of stages to it. Ask them to delete the clause. If you can't delete it, can you modify it? So let's say it says um, delays need to be notified upstream within 24 hours of you becoming aware. Yeah. If you can't take the condition precedent part of that clause out, can you extend that time? table from 24 hours to 48, 36, yeah. whatever. Um, if you can't do that, if they won't take it out and they won't amend it, yeah. at least you've identified it. You know what you've got to do and when you've got to do it. So yeah. have that operational checklist that I was saying about and yeah. make sure everyone on site knows that if anything happens that's going to delay the works, site gets told, uh, the office gets told about it immediately. Yeah. Because you, they've then passed that information back to the office. You know, you can report. Yeah. It's a category, to category one risk. Yeah, it's a category yeah, one. Yeah. One hundred percent, it's a category mm. one risk. And I suppose we we haven't talked about the client here in in this model at all either. Mm. And I suppose it'd be unfair not to, you know, give the 
the perspective of the client because mm. the client could very well write certain contractual obligations on the principal contractor yep. which obviously transfers down to the contractor yep. get passed down back to back the main yeah. contractor might be going here listen Sam to be fair like hands are tied my hands are tied here mm. I, I want to do the best by the, the contractor but I, like if mm. I agree to, to him or her that puts me in jeopardy because I'm going against my own contract with the client and the client can then hold me accountable and stuff like that so yeah. I suppose everybody needs to be aware that the, it's it's not rose tinted glasses here that there needs to be a full no no ab absolutely right you know and if you're if you're in that middle position as the main contractor you need to be making sure that any contracts you do issue downstairs are downstairs downstream, downstream are yeah. back to back yeah because it's quite easy if, if you're let's take an example you know we were talking about a moment ago if the subcontractor issues their own set of terms upstream yeah they're not going to match what's being issued downstream to the main contractor yeah from their client so they're going to be stuck in this position where what they're expected to do doesn't marry up with the information they're getting passed upstream yeah. or what their obligations are back downstream. Yeah, and I think this is where some of the risk uh, starts to get inherent into contracts is that if you have, and again, I don't want to bash principal contractors or main contractors by any means. There's some fantastic uh, companies out there that do a great job. But if, they don't, if they're not on point and they're not on their game, and then the flow of information and obligations mm -hmm. on their side has not been carried out to the letter of the law and the client then punishes them uh, what we've seen as well is then then the the main contractor prince contractor has no other um, choice but other than to send it downhill and sort of yeah put the pressure on the contractor and say well you know it, it is our risk but we're passing that risk on to you because mm. And, th and then the contractor's looking at the principal contract and going, well, like, hold on a minute, you're the one that should be now asking us for these day worksheets mm. in the first place. Uh, you know, you never asked us, so you never asked us to sign it. And, well, tough, you know what I mean? We're not paying you because, well, you know, we can't get paid. Like, what do you do? Do you, do you, do you go out, do you say, Mr. Client, uh, we want to talk to you and Mr. Principal Contractor? Or Mr. Principal Contractor goes after Mr. Client and says, you know, you're not fulfilling your your end of the bargain yeah so i mean un until we start talking about collateral warranties that you're you're not going to have that direct contractual link between yeah the specialist subcontractors and the end client yeah so a any any disputes any complaints gripes whatever have to go through the main contractor whether that's upstream or downstream yeah and it might be that it has nothing to do with one of the parties on either end of that yeah. chain. It might just be solely between main contractor and, and client yeah. or, or main contractor and subcontractor. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to go all the way up or down the chain. It, it depends on the circumstances. I, I'm listening to you here and I'm going like, number one, it's a no brainer why you wouldn't have someone like yourself on standby. Number two, have you have, do you have a model where you'd say, right, crack on, I'll tell you what you do. Will accept the level of risk if you're happy. Well, if they say they're happy to accept the level of risk, uh, with a few caveats that they've managed to iron out within the contract, and then they say, "Look, in the balance of risk, Sam, we're going to take this job mm. uh, because number one, whatever reason." And yeah. so they take it on. But have you got a model where you say, "Right, take it on," but let's manage the risk with you as a team effort going forward so we'll audit your yeah I'd operations to a point that we're seeing gaps that you're gonna come a cropper later on in the contract or i think not not on a kind of day-to-day -day no no hand-holding basis but we'll, i, th we'll I think where that. we would do that sort of thing we would try and give the client as many of the tools as they needed up front yeah to understand where the risks are and what they need to be doing as the project progresses to yeah. mitigate those risks. But we'd always be on the end of the phone. Yeah. If a client goes, look, they've said this to us or this has happened on site. Can you just guide us through what do we need to be saying? Yeah. Or, or equally importantly, what should we not be saying? 100%. And it's, it's about, you know, sometimes we'll sit there in the background and say, right, okay. Definitely don't say that. <laughs> you, you you need to have a, a paper trail that records that you have said the other. Yeah. So let's let's not us start writing because that looks a bit aggressive mid contract and whatever. Yeah. Let us give you some wording. You can put that into an email or a notice or whatever you need to, and send that across to the other side. 
it doesn't have to be done in an aggressive way, but you're just putting that paper trail there. Yeah. So quite often we'll be involved in that sort of Yeah, or how to construct yeah. an email to, yeah. to respond in a correct yeah. manner so that you create a logic yeah. that is transparent mm. and that you're demonstrating that you're trying to do the right thing yeah. and you're alerting the person or the individual or the corporate identity. Um, what's your view on recordings and recording meetings and not, not letting people know that you've a dictaphone in your pocket and... You know, then the, oh, don't worry, Sam, we have it all on, on dictaphone here. Yeah, you, you can't rely on that as evidence. Um, I mean, you, you you might be able to in a meeting, a subsequent meeting with them where you said, well, uh, look, you, that's what you said. Um, but, you know, if you get into court or anything, you're not going to be able to rely on that if it's been... It's not if, discoverable. If, no, if, if you've made that recording secretly, yeah, you're not going to be able to rely on it. You need to say to them, look, is it okay if I record this meeting? Yeah. And again, you know, question yourself. Why would you do that? Well, if the other party goes, absolutely not. Yeah. Okay, why? What are you going to say in that meeting? I mean, it, it sets a very different tone for a meeting, doesn't it? Yeah, if somebody well, goes, trust, I'm going to record trust this. Trust is out the window. Yeah, immediately, everyone's going to be a bit more guarded. Yeah, so you could, you, you, you it's okay. Well, I'm not going to put words into your mouth, but um, it's okay for your own personal use so that you remind yourself when you're, maybe going back to your personal diary and writing your notes of what you heard in that meeting and what you need to take account of. But what you're saying, it's not discoverable by law yeah. as a piece of evidence. I, I think if you recorded it and took that away and made, like, immediately made a note of it, yeah, um, I can understand that. If you're two years down the line... yeah. And we're getting into court proceedings yeah. and we need to give a witness statement and we go, well, let me dig out that recording from two years ago. Yeah. Are you going to have a bit, well, a few more issues with that? Because yeah. cause you're supposed to give a witness statement from your recollection of what happened. Yeah. So you're not even Without really notes. supposed to read yeah. too much around the contemporaneous documents. It's it's about what's in your mind. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you, you, you made that point. Like, But I suppose we have AI coming into place now as well. So... A lot of meetings are probably going to have AI introduced into the meet meeting. Mm. And of course, there's plenty of software that takes notes anyway. Yeah, I mean, I don't, you don't have to say, oh, I've got a dictaphone in my pocket. Do you mind if I put it on the table? I, I don't see why it should be a massively contentious thing. If you want to say, look, we've got to take me minutes of this meeting. Yeah. That's useful for everybody. And, and they are really useful when it comes to resolving disputes later. Yeah. So the most accurate way to do that is we take a recording. So you sit there and start the meeting, can we just record this? Yeah. You know, we use a, a voice recognition software that turns that into a typed up note immediately. Yeah. Um, you, you, you're on the Construction Excellence. You're a, you're mm. a chairman of Construction mm. Excellence um, Group. Can you tell me about that? What's what's the basis? What's yeah. the terms of reference? Yeah, so Constructing Excellence is a, a national brand and it, it's separated out into regions and then like local clubs. So we set up the Essex Club um, must be a year and a half, two years ago. Okay. We started to formulate the plan, a few of us like-minded people. Um, we've been running events, monthly events, for just over 12 months now. So not not uh, legal specific? No, no, not at all. It's, it's about bringing people together from all, all parts of the industry. So, yeah. you know, our membership is made up of main contractors, specialist subcontractors, loads of, of like the professional consultants. We've got loads of architects, surveyors, engineers, yeah, lots of lawyers, like specific construction lawyers. So it's a broad spectrum of people from within the industry. Yeah, Our events have been a mixture of sort of traditional networking, um, thought sharing, yeah, so knowledge sharing, you know, talks. Yeah. Um, and we 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 just we've just launched our awards for 2024. So we've got our awards ceremony. Fantastic. Um, 24th of April. So is that a membership-led uh, organisation? Yeah. So there's a small charge for uh, either individual or corporate members. And then probably small charges for events and stuff like that. Or Most of the events are free. Uh, oh, brilliant. There's a small charge for non-members. So giving back again. So yeah. it's, it's and it's. Peer, peer and, and, and it's all focused, you know, it, it is what the name says. It's all focused on trying to um, drive excellence in yeah. the construction industry. I, I, I totally commend you because it's definitely, there's a there's a massive need for this sort of peer-to-peer -peer learning mm. yeah. within the industry. And there's not, I don't believe there's not enough 
being done a lot of people are isolated and maybe you know don't have access or don't feel that they have mm. access to this sort of network of information and like why wouldn't you like what are you, you're talking about once a month or something like that to meet yeah and you know it's optional whether you go to every event or, yeah. or just the ones that you think are of particular interest to you are they online or in person or they've both? all been in person so far okay um i wouldn't say we'd rule out online, online events yeah. but I, there seems to be very much a desire to get for people to get in a room with other people and yeah and get back to that old-fashioned kind of yeah way of cup of tea you know, and how yeah. are you getting on and what are you doing that's different yeah. and learning about what's mm. trending and what's not trending yeah so what are you seeing that's trending and not trending well we've um we've got an update on the building safety act okay uh that's next week yeah which it got postponed from november because we, we had to cancel the event due to the um there were storms the night of, of the event but we've got you know phenomenal level of subscription to that it's, okay. it's going to be one of our most well attended events so for people that are not aware of that act what's the premise of the act and how is that going to affect their business um uh, it's only going to be relevant really to people involved in high-rise cladding um and it's it's extended design liability for architects and like as well so mm. it's it's given them a, a, a longer period of potential liability for defects. Okay, so it, does that come out of Grenfell? Uh, is that yeah. sort of like it's one it, of the it, it, absolutely one, one of the yeah yeah, yeah uh, sort of key Grenfell. outputs is to try and develop this sort of design culture. Yeah, would, would, would culture be the right word or the standards be better, a better word? Yeah, it's it's all about trying to raise standards and avoid these sorts of tragedies happening again. I mean, Grenfell yeah. was. was horrific wasn't it yeah um, and uh, you know without going into the whole ins and outs of the of the tragedy um yes there's always opportunities to learn out of catastrophic failure mm. um, but unfortunately we shouldn't have to go into catastrophic failure in order to learn um but again uh, some might take it the opinion that there's a lot of jargon that was used in a lot of data and a lot of technical documentation and then when you kind of peel back the layers, there was no substance behind some of yeah. that data. Um, and I suppose it's people like yourself and companies like yourself, trusted companies like yourself, that are going to be the ones that people are going to have to turn to, to make sure that their own paperwork is exactly who they say they are mm -hmm. and what their mission as a company is and what their values are as comp companies are. And I'd say you've probably even had situations where you said, look, we can't help you because you've probably seen the company and said, look, nah, you know, I don't like the way you do business or I don't like the way you're, you're, you're angling yourself or, or, you know, um, how do you, yeah, do you I, that? I, like, I, I don't, I don't think we tend to necessarily turn clients down because we, we don't like their ethos. Mm -hmm. I think we'll, it, you know, ultimately it's about doing the best we can for the client. Mm -hmm. um, but we will certainly try and steer things in a way which we think is appropriate. Yeah. And then let them be the judge of their own destiny after that. If, yeah. they, if they take that and say, yeah, that's that sounds like a reasonable way to act on, um, or, or some people might say, no, I'm not doing that. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I've got a proven model here and you can't tell me you know, I can change, I'm going to change that. Yeah. You know, ultimately, I mean, talk about sort of, let me get back to, I think you asked the question before and I'm, I think we, we went off on a tangent about if we're instructed to draft a really onerous contract, mm -hmm. you know, if that's what the client wants to, whether that's upstream or downstream, mm -hmm. if it's, you know, a subcontractor saying, well, or, or a main contractor issuing a, a contract upstream saying that we want to get on the front foot here we want yeah. we want these terms yeah, that allow us to dictate how we're going to do things um that's fine you know we can give you the tools for doing that mm. likewise if, if somebody says well actually i i want to have a lot of control over this project yeah. i want to make sure nothing goes off the rails i want a really tightly worded contract you know again we can do that we we're obliged to act in the client's best interest and on, on their instructions yeah um but we will say to them look the where we think they're trying to go too far, we'll we'll, we'll yeah. be obliged to say to them, look, that's not going to be legally enforceable or reasonable. Or yeah, yeah, you're going to struggle to get sympathy. It yeah. might be as simple as saying, look, 
you could put that clause in. Yeah. But if you end up in an adjudication, you're not going to get the sympathy of the adjudicator. Yeah. Or if you're in court, you're not going to get the sympathy of the judge. That's not... That doesn't decide the dispute because the dispute's decided on the law and the facts. Yeah. But you don't want to be starting from a position of having the person who's deciding the dispute thinking that you are a horrendous business. Yeah. You know, you, you're, you're, you're on the back foot, you know. Yeah. You, I'm glad you said that, Sam. That's like, again, I'm, as you're talking, I'm saying to myself, I wonder is there a style and tone of language um, depending on which legal practice you go to? Yeah, I guess there. I, I, I guess there will be. Yeah, we, we've we've all got our own styles. I mean, yeah. in in the style of the drafting, there will be. Although you you tend to get a lot of the same language used, but just used in slightly different ways. Yeah, um, and to different degrees, and that's because the law puts very specific meanings on certain phrases and words. So yeah. we we will use the same sorts of terminology. Yeah. I think where we're different is maybe in our communications with our clients. Yeah. A, a new client said this to me the other week about just that kind of, we don't, we don't talk like lawyers. Yeah. And yeah, it's like, yeah. well, we're not, we're almost not trying to. Well, I have to say, like, even today, like you haven't really thrown any jargon into this conversation whatsoever. I could have met you in a coffee shop mm. and had, uh, you know, not knowing that you were a legal expert and, yeah. and it has to be like fair play to you for that. Cause it, like, that's a really big part of, of who we are as a firm and certainly what I'm trying to create within my construction team. Yeah. It, people that can sit down and have a conversation. You know, if I turn up in here with a, my tie done up and in a pinstripe yeah. suit. Yeah. Barrier straight away. It, it's a very different conversation. Yeah. And I start using long legal definitions and yeah. my clients are going to be turned off to that very quickly. Yeah. And, you know, we talked about it at the start about um, you know, quoting case names. The only time I really need to quote a case name is if I'm writing something to put in front of an adjudicator or a judge. Yeah. When I'm talking to my to clients, up your argument. my clients don't need me to tell them the case name. They just yeah. need me to tell them what they can or can't do. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all they need to know. So in terms of resolution, like your, your dispute resolution, your head of the, that department, mm. how many is in your department? Uh, 12 of us. Oh my God. That, that, encompasses all of dispute resolution. So doing construction okay. and is others. six of us. Yeah. Um, but that's hundred percent construction caseload. So those wow. people aren't dabbling in bits of this and that and the other. It's all construction. So do you see that this is a growing industry? Yeah. And that's a problem. Yeah. So there's a trend that's you know, there's gonna be more of a need for resolution in the construction sector it and it's not rectifying itself. It feels like it at the moment. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've heard kind of people calling out for a, like for the government to say in and go, Here, here's a contract that everybody has to sign up to in construction. So it's fair. Yeah. It's like that. Yeah. S sorry to the listeners, but that's never going to happen. Yeah. It's going to, it takes away the party's rights contract on whatever terms they want. Yeah. Which is a really fundamental part of English law. So that's never going to happen. So we've still got this constant tension. You know, I know what I, I said before, I, we act for a lot of um, clients, main contractors, subcontractors, who are all really, really decent people. Yeah. You know, respectable companies that want to do things fairly. But there's a lot of where it's not done that way. Yeah. And there is friction. And I don't see that ending. Yeah. That's unfortunate, mm -hmm. but it, it also echoes the point why they need you guys on board and mm -hmm. have at least uh, an engagement process. It, it, you know, you don't necessarily need to put you guys on a retainer, I take it, that th all that needs to happen is that the conversation has, has been had mm. and that there's an awareness. Uh, and the fact that you guys, it's the first time I've heard someone saying, yeah, we actually provide training yeah. on awareness of where the red spots or red flags are on the contracts mm. like that's like for the takeaway today from that podcast from today's podcast unmeasurable uh, value on yeah. the table there and then and it also says we trust ourselves that we know we're giving you the best advice and therefore we don't have to yeah you know go around charging you for this we will actually help you through the process to well, the point funnily enough you know I, i've said this 
time and time again, you know, prevention is better than cure, yeah. it's cheaper than cure. And from my perspective, you know, I'm more than happy to jump in on an adjudication or court proceedings and, and have that fight. Yeah. That's fine. But actually, I do get more job satisfaction out of sitting around in a room like this. Yeah. You know, we might have five, 10, 15 people in the room and we'll talk to them about their business. And we'll tell yeah. them how to improve their business, avoid the risk. Yeah. Stay away from those disputes. Yeah. And it's such a, a, a beautiful part of the job because you can see those light bulbs going off. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. go, oh, right. So if I just do that or don't yeah. do that. Yeah. And it, it's brilliant. You know, I, I was, re- really I, I, enjoyed it. Honestly, that. I was getting hairs on my arms, sticking up on my arms, listening mm. to some of what you were saying today because I don't know what it is, but like some people have, like it has to change. This inherent, oh, I don't want to bring the solicitors in because they're going to cost us money. Mm. And, you know, they're only going to tell me the bad news and they're only going to, you know, turn me off and tell me not to sign the contract. That's not the case. That's not what you said here I, today. I, I, I'll tell you what we will do. If you, if you leave it till the end and it's all gone wrong and we say, right, can we see the contract? And, the, you know, the client's saying, well, I can't believe they can do that. And we look at the contract and go, well, they can do that because it's in the contract that you signed. Yeah. yeah. I don't like being that messenger. That's, that's not a pleasant conversation to have to have. Bring us in at the start. We don't have to be the bearer of bad news. Yeah. We can be the people that go, well, here's a load of helpful tips. Yeah. And I, I think one of the things that's really important is not sitting there and going, well, section 108 of the Construction Act says you can do, you know, that's going to turn everyone off. It's about going, right, so we recognise you're going to be sent these contracts. You probably haven't got time to read them all. You don't necessarily know everything that's in it. Yeah. You feel like there's that commercial pressure to sign it. Yeah. What do you do about it? Yeah. You know, you've got a contractual term that says variations can only be instructed in writing. And if you don't get the instruction in writing, you're not getting paid for that variation. Yeah. And we see that all the time. Or within 24 hours, we don't. It's not but case. we know when you're on site, someone goes, you need to do that. And it's a variation. And you don't get it in writing. Yeah. Because it happens too quick. Yeah. So how do you manage that? And what yeah. do you do with it? So yeah. we'll, there's no point in us sitting there and going, yeah, yeah, but the contract says that. But the contract says that. Yeah. We've got to apply that in the actual context in which these these things happen but like the other thing that that sparks me from this conversation is the training education that people get from listening to you you wouldn't get in you wouldn't get that in university you're offering people you know site managers charging foremen Mm. contracts managers regional managers directors of the business evidential evidence of contract law yeah. and and red flags as a training that like no one that's it's a, a, unmeasurable because mm. you know these people are going are to then take that information onto the next project and then they're going to if they bring in new charge and form and they're going to educate those people here by the way watch that clause because sometimes yeah. you know like this one comes up yeah and, and like, it's stuff that you know that's brilliant it, I, it, it'd be lovely to look back in 50 years time and go look we started doing that training and look now those people have caught the next generation, the next generation yeah. of that knowledge is passed on, you know. Yeah, look. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be great if that happened. Sam, um, where, do we, where do we find you? I, I, like, I, I'll tell you what, if I have a construction business, you're number two probably on my list. Number one is the wife. Number two is... <laughs> I was going to say who's number one. Yeah. <laughs> where do we find you? Like uh, Websites? emails yeah, yeah. Like, well, how do we get in touch with you so we're homes-hills.co.uk okay That's homes with an L like Sherlock Holmes yeah um, my email address is just scb at homes-hills okay um, we'll put that in the description yeah the I mean we're, we're me and the rest of the team we're all over LinkedIn so you know follow us on there and we're, so, we're, all, we're always putting out tidbits and things for people to is it as easy like if someone's listening to this and coming home and going do you know what I wouldn't mind just having a chat with that guy is that something that you know yeah, yeah, again, re- yeah reach out give us a call drop us an email yeah shoot us a message through LinkedIn whatever brilliant um, yeah and I think we spoke about maybe we could give them some sort of tips maybe a, a one page mm. document that guys could download as well to yeah, sort yeah. Of give them some sort of educational purposes on contract law and stuff like that just to be aware of maybe yeah we can we can, we can do that kind of but like top tips yeah top tips yeah sam you're an amazing uh professional and 
like I'm blown away. Honest to God, I think you, you, you've, 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 a fantastic organization as well. That like a legacy business there that's strong and that you know is not sounds like it just it's not the uh, the high street prices, but it meets everybody's budget. And don't be shy to get involved or get get in touch with you. Absolutely, and, you know, no, yeah, more than happy to take people's calls. Yeah, thanks very much for coming in today, Sam. Thank you very much for having me. Every success, and yeah, and, and the same. With the loads of people contact you. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got a busy day tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Take care, buddy. Nice. Cheers, Gavin. Bye, bye.